Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're back talking about the cardiovascular system, vasodilators and antihypertensives, and this is part two. Next, we're going to talk about a class of vasodilators called nitrates. Nitrates all deliver nitric oxide to the vascular smooth muscle, and this causes vasodilation. Now, nitric oxide is actually a normal endogenous substance in your body. Your endothelial cells release nitric oxide all the time as part of autoregulation to control the smooth muscles in your, in your vasculature. There are drugs that can uh, use nitric oxide to cause vasodilation. The most famous is probably sildenafil or Viagra, which increases local availability of the endogenous nitric oxide. And nitric oxide also has roles in platelet activation and aggregation and adhesion. Nitric oxide is rapidly inactivated by hemoglobin, which may explain, incidentally, why it is that patients who have a subarachnoid hemorrhage are at increased risk for cerebral vasospasm because of all the hemoglobin floating around from the bleed, scavenging up all the nitric oxide. But the point is that nitric oxide disappears very, very quickly when it enters the bloodstream. So in fact, if we want to deliver nitric oxide to a specific tissue, sometimes it's best to administer it directly. For example, we can give people inhaled nitric oxide, which is a selective pulmonary vasodilator because it goes right to the lungs. And this can be used to bronchodilate and improve VQ matching, and is often used in the treatment of very sick patients with pulmonary hypertension or adult respiratory distress syndrome or acute lung injury. As I said, nitric oxide is inactivated by hemoglobin. It actually combines with hemoglobin to form methemoglobin. And so when patients are being treated with inhaled nitric oxide, uh, we often monitor their methemoglobin levels to make sure that they don't suffer from methemoglobinemia. Nitrates can also be taken orally. The two that you may most commonly see in your patient's medication lists include isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. And these are used in the treatment of angina or chest pain due to coronary disease. And the dinitrate is also used in the treatment of, coronary, of congestive heart failure. Side effects from these drugs are related to the vasodilation. So you may say, see headache as well as some hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. Now the IV nitrates, most commonly nitroglycerin and nitroparoside, are very short-acting drugs, again, because the nitric oxide is rapidly uh, inactivated in the bloodstream. So these drugs have a quick onset of action and a very short-lasting effect. The first drug we'll discuss is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, as you can see, has three groups that can, that can release nitric oxide. And through a glutathione-dependent pathway, this drug is, is metabolized into nitric oxide. Nitroglycerin can be used for a variety of, of of possibilities. Uh, it can be used for controlled hypotension. It's not as potent as sodium nitroprusside, which we'll discuss next, but it is effective at dropping blood pressure. We expect to see some reflex tachycardia as we drop the blood pressure. Nitroglycerin does cause some cerebral vasodilation because, again, it causes vasodilation of most vessel beds, and this will lead to an increase in intracranial pressure and cerebral blood flow. And again, patients can get headache from this treatment. Nitroglycerin can also be used in the OB setting for uterine relaxation, and this may be necessary if there are retained products of conception, um, you know, a piece of placenta or something like that, that needs to be removed. Uh, the obstetrician may ask us to give nitroglycerin to relax the uterus so they can extract the remaining products of conception. This dose is usually a relatively large dose of 50 to 100 microgram IV bolus, sometimes even 200 micrograms. You can technically get methemoglobinemia with nitroglycerin, but it's pretty rare because it's r rapidly metabolized in the liver. The treatment of methemoglobinemia is methylene blue. Nitroglycerin can also be given sublingually under the tongue, transmucosally or transdermally. These mechanisms are nice because they avoid the first pass effect where the nitroglycerin is taken up in the liver. These treatments are used for angina, and they work by increasing coronary perfusion to the ischemic subendocardium, again, through the mechanism of vasodilation. Now, when we give IV nitroglycerin, it usually comes in a glass bottle, 50 milligrams and 250 mils, which is 200 mics per milliliter. 
And if you're going to give a bolus, you always want to start small, especially in an anesthetized patient. As low as 10 micrograms, up to maybe 100 micrograms, is an IV bolus. And then usually we run this drug as an infusion, anywhere between 0.5 and 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. A good rule of thumb for nitroglycerin, if you're not sure where to start or the math is overwhelming you, is just start the drip at 10, milligra 10 milliliters an hour, and then you can sit down and do the math and titrate the, the drip. Nitroglycerin can be absorbed into the plastic tubing, and so it's often recommended that you waste the first 10 or so cc's through the plastic tubing to bind up all those plastic sites. Patients do often develop tolerance to nitroglycerin within about 24 hours of sustained treatment. The other IV drug that's a nitrate is sodium nitroprusside, which is a direct venous and arterial vasodilator. You can see its structure here, and it does have one nitric oxide group that can be released, along with a whole bunch of cyanide groups, and we'll speak about those in just a moment. Again, this nitrate can be used for controlled hypotension, for treatment of hypertensive emergencies, and in cardiac disease. Like nitroglycerin, it can lead to reflex tachycardia, cerebral vasodilation, and increases in intracranial pressure and cerebral blood flow. Sodium nitroprusside, by delivering nitric oxide, actually attenuates the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, the notion that when a lung is not being well ventilated, that we should decrease blood flow to that lung. And that reflex is damaged during treatment with nitroprusside. There's also a potential for coronary steel syndrome, where diseased vessels don't vasodilate as well as other vessels, and therefore the damaged heart that is served by those diseased vessels actually gets even less blood flow than it was getting before treatment was initiated. Sodium nitroprusside comes in the same concentration as nitroglycerin, and in fact the dosing is almost the same as nitroglycerin is too. We usually start with a dose of about 0.3 to 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute, Again, that's about 10 mils an hour. And then we can titrate it up to a common dose, usually somewhere around 2-3 mics per kilogram per minute. Now, nitroprusside has a maximum dose. We say about 10 mics per kilogram per minute for the very short term of less than 10 minutes, or 2 mics per kilogram per minute if you're going to be running them long term on this drug. And the concern is cyanide toxicity, again, coming up next. This drug breaks down in light, and so the tubing and the bag have to be wrapped in black plastic or foil. And certainly patients being treated with this drug should have continuous arterial blood pressure monitoring. Now, nitroprusside, as I said, contains a lot of cyanide, and the cyanide needs to be metabolized by your body. Usually what your body does is it has a small percentage of hemoglobin that is always met hemoglobin about 1% of your hemoglobin. And methemoglobin is a very good scavenger of cyanide to make something called cyanomethemoglobin. And then the cyanide goes to the livers and to the, to the liver and to the kidneys, where it's converted to thiocyanate by an enzyme called rhodinase. And that requires a sulfur donor, usually a thiosulfate molecule. If there's extra cyanide that isn't scavenged by your hemoglobin, it can lead to toxicity. And cyanide toxicity is very dangerous. This is especially an issue in patients who don't have functioning, well-functioning livers. And if there's any concern about cyanide toxicity, the first thing we should do is stop sodium nitroprusside and switch to a different agent. The earliest sign of nitroprusside toxicity is acidosis. And that's because of what cyanide does to your body. Cyanide inactivates cytochrome oxidase, which basically uncouples the oxidative phosphorylation that occurs in your mitochondria. So it inhibits cellular respiration, which is basically a way of saying there's lots of oxygen in your cells, but they're no longer able to use the oxygen. So it's as if your cells aren't getting oxygen at all. And this leads them to switch to anaerobic metabolism. And a lot of lactate is formed, and that lactate is what causes the acidosis. If it gets bad enough, these patients may need treatment with bicarbonate in order to treat the acidosis. Cyanide also decreases the affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin, so it actually works in more than one way um, in order to cause what we might call like a histotoxic hypoxemia. Other signs of sodium nitroprusside toxicity would be tachycardia, change in mental status, and seizures. You should also be aware that patients can develop tachyphylaxis to nitroprusside, whereby the drug doesn't work as well as it did at the initiation of treatment, 
and so you may see some hypertension. The treatment for cyanide toxicity is first of all to stop nitroprusside. And then the most important thing we want to do is increase the ability of the body to absorb cyanide. And this is done by giving some kind of a nitrate. And what that nitrate does is it converts hemoglobin into methemoglobin. And even though we know that too much methemoglobin is bad, in this case it's going to serve an important purpose of sequestering the cyanide. And what you do then is measure the patient's methemoglobin levels as you're initiating this treatment, and you expect that the levels will remain low because most of the methemoglobin is busy sequestering cyanide. Once you see the methemoglobin levels start to climb, then you know that you don't need any further treatment for nitrates. At that time, patients are treated with sodium thiosulfate, and that's in order to facilitate the next step of creating this rhodonese enzyme in the liver that converts cyanide into thiocyanate, and then eventually to the kidneys for excretion. One other treatment for cyanide toxicity is vitamin B12, which can chelate cyanide and again lead to renal excretion. So those are the two nitrate compounds that we commonly use as vasodilators, nitroglycerin and sodium nitroprusside. We'll stop here. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll continue again with the next video.